We're in a series on worship. How many of you, you have worship all figured out? You know everything there is to know about worship. Okay, I don't see any hands going up. So that means we still have something to learn. I, I just doing this series and uh, revisiting some of these things, I'm like, Lord, he, he, there's one thing I'll talk about next week that it's just, I was like, like I learned it for the very first time. And I've been around doing this in my almost 25th year in, in, in pastoral ministry, and uh, it was just like brand new. Uh, uh, so I'll talk more about that next week. But we, there's so much to learn about worship, but yet it's so simple. It's so simplistic, we've maybe complicated, but it's important to know the significance of worshiping God as a follower of Him. So many times we just think, well, I follow Jesus, but we don't worship Him. And, and there's a big gap, and, and, and it's very important that we visit this and find out what that looks like in our lives. What does it look like to worship God? Um, Colossians chapter, uh, if you can get me to, you got already there, perfect. Uh, this is what Colossians chapter uh, 1 says, verse per, uh, part of 16. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him, emphasis on through him. We get that part. We're like, yeah, I know God created me. Isn't that cool? God created me. I'm down with that. I'm okay with that. But what about the next part? Not only were we were created through him, but we were created for him. You and I were created for God. It's, the, it's really that simple. We were created for Him. Let me get that back. There. We were created for God. That means your life's not your own. I don't own me. You don't own you. We're accountable for our actions. We're accountable for ourselves. One day we'll stand before the Lord and He'll say, what have you done with your life? Yeah, there's, there's a part there that we can own, but, but when it comes to the bigger picture of things, my life's not my own. Matter of fact, I'm called to lose my life. And when I lose my life, I gain it. And so we were created for God. That means my life is for him. Every decision I make needs to go through him. Everything about life is about him. We were created for him. I was created. You were created for him. Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 24 says, says this, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of the heaven and earth. And does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And so, just a quick reminder, your life is not your own, it's God's. And you were created for his purpose. And worshiping God is a part of that. It comes out of that. It's, it's, that's what it is. To worship God is to recognize God. You created me for you. And I respond by worshiping you. And so we're looking at something that uh, sometimes, I mean, today I want to talk about, um, last week was very general. Today I want to talk about personal, private worship. Like we can, we, 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 sometimes we have this word worship and, and we have it, what, a definition in our minds, but sometimes it's much bigger than that. Sometimes there's, there's parts of worship that maybe we've not understood. Today I want to talk about the significance of your personal worship, your private times with God. What goes on with you and God in your personal lives? And for most of us, when we hear the word worship, we think of it as, as a public setting, like what we do when we go to church on Sunday. Yeah, that is part of it, but there's something, there's something else that goes on in our personal, private lives. This personal worship. Uh, let me ask you a question. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to find something only to discover that you looked in the wrong places? You ever done that? I, got, I mean, I, I keep thinking, this is the one thing that comes to my mind. Uh, I remember, it doesn't happen anymore, but a long time ago, Carlita would send me to the store. She still sends me to the store, don't get me wrong. When she wants to buy something or like, I'm baking, can you go get me this? I need some milk or I need whatever. But there was a point in time when, uh, she hasn't asked me very much in the last number of years, but she would say, can you go to the store and get me some Graham Wafer crumbs? A anybody bake? Anybody know what vet Graham Wafer crumbs are? So I would go to the store, and this happened over and over and over again. I don't know why it didn't click in the first time, but, but it took me several times before I figured out where the Graham wafer crumbs are. And so I would go into the store, and I'm thinking, hey, it's a cookie, it's a cracker, Graham wafer crumbs. Cookies have crumbs, it must be in the cracker aisle. It must be in where the cookies are. And I would go up and down, and, and this actually, this, this particular time, or number of times, this is before cell phones, okay? And so, so it's not like I can, hey, Curly, where are the Graham wafer crumbs? It was so I would have to drive home, and, uh, 
And, you know, I, I couldn't find them. I don't think they sell those kind of things. You know, they got the crackers. I saw the grand wafer crackers in the aisle, but I don't, didn't see any crumbs. No, they're, they're, they're there. They're there. Go back and find them. So I go back, and I walk up and down the aisle. And anybody else like me, you, you, you'll, just, you'll try to look for hours before you ask for help. <laughs> and so I, I, I eventually would get so frustrated. I'm like, okay, I'm going to find somebody. I finally find some. Where are the grand wa wafer crumbs, please? Oh, they're in the baking aisle. And I'm thinking, baking aisle? Like, why would they be in a baking aisle? They're, they're crumbs. They're part of cookies and crackers. And so the, the point is, they're in the store. I was just looking in the wrong places. A lot of times, I, I can relate to life like that. You know, we look for love. You ever hear that? We're looking for love on all the wrong places, right? Some of you have tried that. Doesn't fare too well sometimes. We look for, for you know, desires that we have in life and and all that stuff, we can look in the wrong places to fill those voids. And for years, that was me when it came to worship. I, I, uh, uh, before before I, I uh, became kind of like a lead pastor, I, I would be on staff at different churches over the years. And, and part of my role in many of these churches was, was to kind of oversee the music area and, and to lead worship. And so Sunday after Sunday, you do that. Year after year, you do that. And, and I've always, and for those of you who understand the, the music world, the worship world or whatever, you understand that there's a lot of times you can get up and, and, and do the best you can. You can practice all you want. And for some times, for some reason, it just feels blah. It's like, why does it just feel like there's, it's just not, and, and so we would go all that. We would like, how, how to become a better worship team? How to become, like, what are we doing wrong? What needs to be done that will make things better? How can, and so we would try to figure this out. How can we improve? Trying to figure out how we could worship better, and, and I was looking, the thing is, in the wrong places. I was trying to figure these out in the wrong way. Maybe the answer to meaningful, powerful corporate worship Starts with meaningful, powerful individual worship. Before you even get on a stage. Before you even show up at a church building. Maybe the, the beauty, the idea with, with powerful corporate worship starts with powerful personal worship. And I had to discover that. I had to learn that. Bill, you can't expect to get up in front of people and lead worship expecting them to respond to God in some way when you're not even doing it in your private life. I mean, I knew, I, I know about worship, and I would say, yeah, I worship, but no, no, not the way God requires it. Looking in the wrong places. Could I have been looking for an experience from God in here in a public setting when I needed to do it more in here? This building, we read it earlier, right? God doesn't dwell in buildings built by human hands. He doesn't. He dwells in these kind of buildings, these homes, these houses. And so what I was trying to accomplish in a public setting, I didn't connect the dots that I needed to be doing that in my personal life. And so many times, maybe you come to a, a gathering like this, and, and, uh, and, and you can be guilty of being a spectator, or you can be guilty of not even worshiping God. Maybe you can sing songs, but you know you can do those things and still not worship God. And so personal, private worship is what we want to talk about today. The central theme of the book of Psalms is that. It's worship. If you look at the book of Psalms, I mean, if you don't know the Bible very well, or maybe some of you do, you think, oh, the book of Psalms, yeah, that's, that's got all the small chapters in it, right? You know, they're very easy to read. Oh, or maybe to you, the book of Psalms is like, oh, that's the long chapter. It's got like a long chapter in that book. Yeah, you will find prayers in there. You will find stories and poems, but the central theme is 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 this guy named David who God said he's a man after my own heart. And you look at so many other people in the Bible, and why was it David was seen as a man after God's own heart? Well, you kind of get a glimpse of that if you read through the book of Psalms and read some of the things that he wrote, his personal worship times with the Lord. And they weren't done in a public gathering. They weren't done in the synagogue. They weren't done in those places where people could see they were all done back in the pasture. Back in the quiet place. Worship has always been about God and not us. 
How many of you, 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 you just like, man, I would, I, I'd love to know how to, how to pray over people and, and see people healed. We, 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 we get that. We're like, we crave for those things or, or we crave for like, I just want to be, I want to be, you know, walk in the prophetic or, or, or I want to, I want to know all there is to know about the prosperity, you know, side of Christianity, if that even makes sense. You know, I want to know all these things. I want to become better at them. Well, a lot of the things that we desire, these gifts or whatever, many of them, most, if not all of them, they benefit us in some way but worship's different than that worship is about him it's not for us it's for him and so you and I can actually grow in the area of worship I want to be a better worshiper of God the one who created me I want to do it better, not so much as in like, I want everybody to watch me, but I want my heart. I want to be worshiped. I want to recognize his position in my life. I was created for him. So if I'm created for him, he is due worship. He is due worship from me and from you. See, worship is not, it's not about us. It's, it's about God. And that's why I believe we struggle with being true worshipers at heart because our sin nature says and tries to make everything about us. Did you know you were created in a way, your sin nature says, look out for you. Life's about you. Life's about me. And then God comes along and says, no, 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 no. I created you for me. It's a bit different. It's way different. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. That's why Paul wrote, uh, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. He's talking to the church. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That whole living sacrifice, that's, a, that's deep. What that looks like. He says, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Is my, is my, is my life of worship pleasing to God? I mean, now you can't answer that for me and I can't answer that for you, but I bet you God can answer that for us. Is my worship pleasing to God? Because he says, this is your true and proper worship. Do I offer everything to him? Have I recognized that I was created for, I'm created for him? He specifically, all these years, you and I thought, well, I, I was just put on this earth because, or maybe some of you are like, I'm just an accident. You know, I wasn't supposed to be here. No, no, you were created for a purpose. Maybe some of you think, well, I was created to, to have a successful career, or I was created to be this, or I was created to be that. I'm good at that. That must be why I'm, no, you were created to worship God. Every single one of us in this place was created to worship God. You have a purpose. And I think to understand how big a deal worship is, maybe it's good for us to go back and open our Bibles to when God gave his people a set of guidelines. And last week I mentioned to you, you know, that the, what we know as the Lord's Prayer actually starts off before he even teaches the disciples how to pray, he teaches them how to worship. When he says, hallowed be thy name, it means to exalt, to lift up, to praise God. Before he even teaches the disciples how to pray, he teaches them first how to worship. And then we look at these guidelines, these set of commandments that God gave to the people. You can read about them in the Bible. God made man and woman for us to be in communion with him, to have a relationship with him. We were created to, to worship him, and, and sin wants to keep us from doing that. So God gives the people these set of standards, these group of commands, these guardrails, these guidelines. And even at the very beginning of these ten, ten commandments, I want to show you something. God's teaching the people something about worship. And he says this in Exodus, and God spoke all these words. These are from God. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. And he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You can't. And so he says before. And before he starts off these commands, he's like, I got I to gotta make something clear. He's like, I'm the Lord your God. He said, I'm the one. I'm the one that created you. And I not only created you, but I created you for me. So right at the very beginning of these commandments, God has to establish something with his people. He's like, I'm the Lord your God. Isn't it interesting that before God gives anything on the commandments, he establishes where he belongs in our lives first. He's like, I, I have to be first. It's not going to work for me to be second or third. I've got to be first. He says, I'm the Lord your God. See, God's people needed to know that they just couldn't live whatever way they wanted to live. 
There were guidelines, there were expectations that God has for you, for me, and for them. And he reminds the people of this. That there were many other nations. You understand, when the Israelite people, God gave these commands, they weren't the only people that walked the earth. There were all kinds of other nations. And these nations had all kinds of other gods that they worshipped. And God's like, no, no, they can have all their gods, but that's not the true God. He says, I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one. I created everything. And so God reminds his people that he was their God. That's why Matthew chapter 22, Jesus even emphasizes it when, when, the, when the, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. And they're like, which is the greatest commands of all the, the hundreds of commands? Which is the greatest? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Jesus is kind of, kind of reminding the people, hey, listen, we spoke about this back in when, when we gave the commandments, when God said, I'm the Lord your God. And Jesus reminds the people, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the greatest commandment. And so then he goes on and says, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods. Why does the Ten Commandments start off by letting us know that he's the only God? Maybe it's to help us to understand what worship is. See, we will not worship God if we don't see him as the Lord our God. We can see him as God. We can understand, yeah, I was created through him. But the part that we struggle with is that I'm created for him. And in order for me to worship him, I need to establish that he's first in my life. There is no other God before him, besides him. So right at the very beginning of these commandments, he says, you can't have any other gods before me. He goes on to say, even in more detail, he says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. In the form of anything. He's covering all of his bases here. How many know that idols just don't appear in our lives? Did you know that idols don't just build themselves and then come and knock on our door and say, hey, you need to worship me now? That's not how idols work. They don't create themselves. We create idols. That's what we can be guilty of, creating idols. We make them. That's what idolatry is in the simplest form, is any worship directed in the direction other than God. That's what idolatry is. It's anything that I worship apart from God. And God's like, you can't worship anything apart from me. You can't have any idols in your life. You can't have, worship any forms of anything. He's like, I'm the Lord your God. And in order for us to become worshipers of him, we have to establish that and understand that is the most important thing. He's the Lord your God, and your God, and your God, and your God, and my God. And when I get that, you won't have to twist my arm to worship him. It'll just be in response and an overflow of my heart. You won't have to get me in a place like this and, and, and force me or, or, or have me worship because I feel like it or I don't feel like it. None of those things matter because I've established he's first in my life. So God, you get my worship because I want to worship you. That's what counterfeit gods are, right? Counterfeit God is anything so central to us. Now listen to this because we can actually make forms of anything in our lives without even really knowing it you and I could actually be worshiping things that are forms of anything and not even be aware of it. Almost be oblivious to it. See, a counterfeit God is anything so central to my life, so essential that if I were to lose it, life wouldn't be worth living anymore. An idol has such controlling position or power over our hearts that we can spend most of our passion and energy and emotional and financial resources and not even give it a second thought. I said this a couple weeks ago. We will have what we want to have. You know that, right? So many people say, well, I just don't have the money for it. No, if you really want something, you will find the money for it. You will get what you want to get. You will have what you want to have. You will actually be where you want to be. If you really want to go somewhere, and, and let's say you wanted to go to Calgary today and you didn't have a ride, but you're like, I, I got to get there. Guess what? You will get there because you will find a way. It's just how we're wired. We will be where we want to be, and we'll do what we want to do. 
And that's the thing with these idols, these forms of anything. We, we can actually spend so much energy and financial resources on it and not even think twice because it's become a counterfeit God to us. And sometimes we don't even realize it. And so because these things can become first in our lives and then he becomes second, God becomes second, uh, and our worship to him becomes second, then it really doesn't become that big of a deal, right? Uh, have you ever said this before? Ah, it's just worship. Ah, it's not that big of a deal. It's just worship. Hey, you want to come next week, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. Come next week, I think is going to be very good for us as, as believers in Jesus, as, as a church. I think it's going to be so helpful for us. I'm, I'm looking so forward to it. Make sure you come next week. Because I may know it's more than just worship. Yeah, it's more than just worship. And so these commandments, you've got to understand, they were never meant for the unbeliever. They were meant for those who have a relationship with God. And it appears that, that this is a bigger problem to God than maybe it is for us, right? God's like, oh, this is huge. He's like, I got to establish, I'm the Lord your God, and you can't have any other idols besides me. You cannot serve or have any idols in the form of anything. This was massive to God, but how many know it's not that big of a deal to us? He says, you shall not make for yourself in the form of anything. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And David regarded obedience as the highest form of worship. And he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. David wrote this. But my ears have, you have hope, you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. And then David said, said this, here I am. I have come it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I don't know if you ever read anything about David. I mean, David, David's life was, was really, he understood that he was created for God. And he worshiped God. Was he perfect? No, he wasn't. He did some things that all of us can relate to. He made some decisions that weren't good. He had to come to places of repentance before God, but his heart, the Bible says God saw David as a man after his heart. What does that mean? What does that look like? I believe it means because David had a heart of worship. He understood where God was. Matter of fact, he saw obedience as the highest form. And all throughout David's reign, if you don't know David, David became the king of Israel for like 40 years. He was a ruler. Can you imagine overseeing a whole nation of people? I mean, he just he was in that position of authority. He had he made all the decisions. Can you imagine being in his shoes? David reigned as king for a long time, but for decades before he was a king. He made a point to pull away and worship God privately in the pastures, in the alone times, away from all the distractions. David worshiped God. When Samuel went to David and nobody, just some kid out in the pastures uh, herding sheep, uh, Samuel comes and says, hey, there's got to be somebody else besides all these brothers. Is there anyone else? And, and, and then they're like, oh, yeah, we got a younger brother. He's just out herding sheep. He's not that important. And, and Samuel brings him in and says, you are king. I'm anointing you as king. And guess what? David goes back in the pastures again for like, some say, around 20 years. He's a king. He's an anointed king. And he returns to the very place that maybe got God's attention, this private individual times of worship. Where he spent these times, he wrote these psalms. It was one-on-one -on -one time with David and God. And he understood what it is to be an individual, a private worshiper. And that's what we wanted to talk about today, what it is to worship in our, in our private, in our personal place. Have you ever said things like, it was just meant to be that way, anybody? Ah, that's just the way it is. We say it all the time, right? Ah, that's just how it is. That's the way I was made. I mean, it was always supposed to be that way. There are some things in life, you're right, that are supposed to be that way. I mean, cows, I think, were meant to be milked, right? Produced milk, right? What other purpose does a cow have? I mean, you could eat it, beef, I guess. Yeah, that would be a good one. Cows were meant to, yeah. I mean, birds were meant to fly, right? It's no trick questions. I'm just, I mean, fish were meant to swim, right? I mean, just common sense things, right? 
Cars were meant, here's, the new, here's maybe not a common sense for some of you. Cars in my book were meant to drive, not to sit in the garage and drool over. I'm sorry for all the car lovers out there. I mean, I kind of I think it's funny. You know, they have these car shows, and the guys all drive up, and they're in their cars, and they pull the hoods up, you know. They're, they're, it's kind of cool. You can tell I'm not a car guy. It's kind of cool, though. But a lot of these cars, they leave those places and go right back and sit in a shop until the next car show. And I'm like, why do you have a car if you're not going to drive it? I mean, it's like buying a couch or a chair and not sitting in it. What purpose is it, right? Who buys clothes and don't wear it? Don't answer those questions. All right. Some of you have clothes in your closet that you haven't worn yet. But some things were just meant to be, right? Instruments were meant to play. Okay. You and I were meant to worship. We were meant to worship God. That's the point of your existence, to worship God. I'm sure he has a calling on our lives to reach our world for, for him. He gives us mission. He gives us a mandate. He says, go and make disciples. But I mean, no, that's not possible unless we first love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. You and I were created to worship him. To worship God is to recognize his worth and worthiness. To worship God is to recognize him as Lord. If you maybe you just switch that around, because some of you, well, well, yeah, I worship God, but how about we start using the word Lord? It takes on a whole different context of meaning. When someone is Lord of your life, they rule. They're in control. They make decisions for your best interest. That's why he said, I'm the Lord, your God. The Bible calls this recognizing God as worthy and, and acknowledging him in the way that we're talking about today. As glor- it's, it's to glorify God, Right? Most of David's time was spent in worship, but it was done in the pasture. Let me just conclude by saying this, and we're just gonna we're gonna wrap this up. I'm just gonna close in prayer. Because this is private individual worship. And so this is not something we exercise right here in a public setting and then we go and not do it again. Sometimes we can limit worship to 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 a, a one morning a week um, and a church gathering, and then for the next six days we do nothing when it comes to worshiping God. But maybe God wants to teach us to worship in our quiet place so that when we do come together, our worship will be an overflow of what he's doing in our private lives. Think about that for a moment. Our worship will be an overflow of what he's doing in our our lives when we're in the pastures. When we're in those times when it's just me and God. Lord, I recognize you. Remember, you were created for him and and spending time with God is a huge deal to him. He makes it clear when he, when he gave us these commandments. And therefore, we can conclude that it needs to be a big deal to us as well. And so next week, we're going to talk about corporate worship and how to worship, how we worship God when we're with each other. But I, I, I can say this, I'm willing to bet, if we can just grab a hold of this, and if we can just start having personal alone times in the Word, in prayer, in worship to God, it'll transform how we meet publicly as a corporate body. I'm willing to bet if you learn how to worship God in private, you will no longer spectate in worship gatherings like this. Do you know that you and I, without even knowing it, we can become spectators? It's so easy to do. We stand and we stare or we stand and we observe, or we stand and we just read the screen, and and we can walk into a place and walk out and not even connect with the Lord our God. Because worship is different than anything else. See, what I'm doing right now, I'm equipping you, you're receiving it. You're benefiting from this. That's often why we, we we will never be late for the sermon, but we'll always be late for worship. It's because messages and sermons and equipping and all those things they benefit us in some way we get to take something from that but worship is different worship is all about me not taking a thing but me giving and we can be products of our culture sometimes because we we can be products in a way where where it's all about what i receive if i don't get anything out of this then i'm not involved in it i'm not doing it 
Worship is different. Worship is, it's not about me worshiping God if I feel like it or not. It's I worship God because he's the Lord, my God. And it's no longer just worship. It's no longer a, a small deal because I now recognize how big of a deal it is to God. So I'm gonna invite you to stand as we conclude our time together. And my encouragement to you is to go home and establish times of worship personal, private worship, just you and God. Some of you have figured this out. Many times you will come to a gathering like this or you'll go to a different gathering in a different church somewhere else and you'll see, you can kind of pick out who who know how to worship in private. You can almost, you can just see it. It, it, No matter what it feels, no matter how bad of a day or bad of a week they have, they understand worship. They understand the place that God has in their lives. You can just, you can tell. And you can also kind of tell, and it's not like a written, not like a written rule, but you can kind of get an idea of who really, who doesn't have personal worship, who really don't spend much time with God. You can almost just, it's just there. Sometimes we don't even have to say anything. And so my encouragement to you is how about we all grow in the area of personal worship? How about every single one of us on this place go on a journey together of like David, worshiping God in the pastures? It has nothing to do about singing. It has nothing to do about all this. It's just it's the posture of our heart. Lord, I recognize you're first in my life. And I'm worshiping you. And I'm spending time with you. And I want to get to know you. I want to know your voice. I want to know what makes your heart beat. I want to know you. And I'm telling you, you have that heart. God will reveal himself to you like, like you've never been revealed to before. God will, God will do that. And so I want to pray before we leave. And a lot of times we just we don't get much homework when we leave church, but that's our homework this week. Let's begin to explore what it is to spend time with God. Personal time. Because I, I think it'll change our time together. I mean, there's so much we can talk about David, how he danced before the Lord, undignified. He didn't care. He's like, God, you're most important to me. And so, Father, today as we gather as your church, we thank you for teaching us your word. And, Lord, your mercy is so great. You don't beat us up with this. You don't create shame in our lives. You're not a God of calm condemnation, but you desire us to worship you and you teach us and equip us and you show us how big a deal it is to you and when you establish guidelines for your people including us you right from the very beginning said I'm the Lord your God don't worship anything but me you said and so Father I pray that that will be our hearts as a church as, as a people that follow you that we would, we would value and crave and make priority and be intentional about personal times with you. God, reveal yourself to us in the way that you desire us to know you. Because God, you created us for that reason. We were created through you and for you. So teach us, Lord. Teach us how to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well. Well, bless you for, for being a part of this today. Um, sometimes we do give you opportunity to stay and, and have prayer and just spend some time with the Lord. But I thought with this kind of morning, this kind of message, let's just take this and go put it into practice, right? Let's quit thinking about these things and let's live them out and practice them. And so bless you. Looking forward to seeing you next Sunday. But if you want to come out on Wednesday evening, this Wednesday evening, Life Shared Groups, you're all welcome to be a part of that. For those of you who are part of our kids' ministry and coming to the barbecue at 2, don't forget to share. See you next week. God bless. Have a great rest of your day.